What's up, everybody? Nate here with Frame This Podcast. I am joined by my producer and co-host, Phil. Hello. That's a new title, producer. You're the one that engineers all of the sounds. So I, yeah, decided to I'll do take that. It. I'll take it. Yeah, I got a promotion today. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of promotions, uh, our guest today is a good friend of mine, Dr. Matt Borden. Um, he is literally a plant doctor there's a doctor in the house yeah there is a he's our first our first guest with a uh with a phd so matt would you mind uh introducing yourself a little bit more and telling the audience about what it is you do before we uh pick it apart absolutely well uh first what i don't do is i don't grow vast amounts of weed which is uh (laughs) Very unfortunately, what most people hope I'm going to say when I when they hear that I'm a plant doctor. Um, so sorry to disappoint half the audience <laughs> right off the bat. There, you don't you don't have a you don't have dreadlocks and a burlap sack and you know some dream catchers behind your desk. <laughs> I, I don't, but you know it's a backup career. I I, could, I should keep that in mind. Uh, so. Uh, I'm also not an herbalist, which is probably just lost the other quarter of the remaining remaining audience there. Uh, That's but yeah, a made-up title, right? That's not a real science. Yeah, herbology. A, it is a totally a real title. There are a lot of herbologists out there, mostly self-proclaimed, though. Is it I a real it was science, like a, though? For Harry Potter thing. <laughs> no, you'd be surprised. Something for everybody. Uh, so those those are the things that I'm not. What I am is a doctor for plants. So what that means is people bring their sick plants to me, either in person or I go out to their properties or they send me a lot of photos online. And then my job is to assess the situation, diagnose what's wrong with them and, uh, you know, tell them what it is, explain it and explain what they can do about it. Sometimes that's, you know, using certain pesticides or biological controls or talking a lot about the ecology of the situation. So that's what I do. When I say that I'm a plant doctor, it means that my job is to figure out how to keep plants healthy and what to do when people have plants that are unhealthy. Yeah. Sweet. I was doing a little research today. So that means I'm going to try to get this right. You're, you're not a, are you a, you're not a botanist or are you a botanist? Or does that kind of fit into the not really. What, what is what is the Venn diagram of what you do? Yeah. What yeah. could also be considered botany? Very little, surprisingly. Botanists tend to really dig into the weeds, so to speak, of pl- the relationships between plant groups and the nomenclature, the naming of them. They love plant conservation. They, they love working with a specific family of plants. Um, so that's not much of what I do. They do a lot of uh, phylogenetics, studying the relationships between plant groups, studying their genes, things like that. Um, so what you're saying is you're not a huge plant nerd, but you can still <laughs> consider yourself a plant nerd, but you, you are yes. saving, you are saving plants. Yeah. We're all saving plants in different ways and I can keep up with the botanists and, and they can understand some of what I do, but we're definitely different areas of plant science. In fact, a lot of people try to go to botanists to, to grow plants. And um, I hate to say it, but a lot of botanists are really terrible at growing plants. Botany and <laughs> horticulture are two different things. Um, so sometimes, you know, people are like, oh, I need to talk to a botanist. And the horticulturalists are like, no, you need to talk to me. And then the plant doctors are over here are like, no, that plant's sick. You need to talk to me. So we all have our niches in the plant science world. It just reminds me of the Spider-Man meme pointing. Yes. Everyone's pointing at one another. <laughs> And there's a dying plant in the center. Exactly. I should make that meme. That's a good idea, man. You're welcome. Do that. <laughs> we have good ideas here. And then there's the other meme where there's like old Spider-Man sitting there like looking at a situation. And there's young Spider-Man sitting there and taking notes. So I, I was wondering, Matt, like where do you fall on like the hierarchy of who gets asked the question first? So like, so, like a customer has a question or like someone who has plants has a question like, where do they start on the work your way down the finger pointing pole? 
usually people will first talk to their neighbor and their neighbor will be like, oh, I don't know. And then they'll talk to their garden center or the local nursery. And then sometimes they'll talk to their master gardener community. Sometimes they'll take that to the extension agents. And then the extension agents, if they don't know, will take it up to their state diagnostic laboratories or to a private company, which is where I work now. And then I'm pretty much up there at the top. So if if the situation is not clear cut and the diagnostic labs cannot figure it out, or maybe they think there's more to the story, uh, then I go out and assess the situation. So in terms of plant health hierarchy, I'm I'm really loving where I am, and it's nice to be, you know, the expert finally after ten years in school. So Ooh. it it's. It, and I, I say that with a great deal of, of humbleness because we're still wrong all the time and there's always so much to learn. Um, but, you know, if if I don't know, I at least know who to talk to and, and who to help figure things out. So, and yeah, I love it. I, I should add before I go too much further, I actually don't have a PhD, Nate. I have a different terminal degree called a doctor of plant medicine. And it's a, it's a pretty niche part of graduate school programs. There's only a couple in the U.S. and then a few overseas. Uh, University of Nebraska has one. University of Florida has one. Um, so the doctor of plant medicine degree, my kind of doctorate, uh, was actually a recent introduction to plant sciences, and it came out of a need to have a more broad spectrum approach to plant health. So people will get like... So you're like a general physician for plants. Exactly. Exactly. Got you. Um, so like, you know, just like your, your family doctor just for plants. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Um, yes, yes. So there's people out there with PhDs in plant pathology and they go really hardcore in depth into a certain fungal disease or, you know, a, a bacterial disease, things like that. Uh, and then there's people with PhDs in entomology who go really in depth into researching certain insect issues. And my job is to know about all of those subjects, but refocus my time to be more, more broadly focused. So I can go out to a site and instead of knowing everything there is to know about one specific disease, I can know enough about it to recognize it for sure and probably how to treat it. But I also need to be able to look at the soil, the environmental conditions, um, look at the roots, you know, look at nematode problems, which are tiny worms in the soil. Look at how the grower has been treating it, because um, that's a huge factor, the human human part, human interactions. So my job is to kind of maintain that broad spectrum approach. Um, and this was kind of born out of a need for that in the plant industry, where people were recognizing, like, we need more people out who can do this kind of approach to plant health. Um, so it's it's been pretty cool. I've I've always wanted to do this kind of thing. And it was awesome that there are programs like that and it took a long time, many exams, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a good career. I'm happy with it. So you're did- the more approachable one out of all plant scientists. You can actually have a conversation with <laughs> a layman like us two and sort of help us understand things. Whereas, uh, an entomologist or, uh, I guess botanist would bore the shit out of us. <laughs> <laughs> I will neither confirm or, nor deny that because I'm going to get in trouble with all my entomologists and botanist friends. Okay. Uh, but yes, part of my job is... Your is secret is safe here. <laughs> it's, it's definitely understanding how to talk to people about their plant problems uh, from a, a basic level up. And a lot of that is kind of like back and forth psychology of talking to people to figure out what they think of the problem, you know, and then figuring out how much they trust me how much I trust them. Um, you, know, you guys watch the show House, right? Remember mm-hmm, you, Laurie? Mm-hmm, House? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great show. Great show. And not only is it one of my favorite shows, but oddly enough, there's a lot of parallels between that show and, and what I do. So when I think of like, how am I going to do my job and, and, and the approach to it, uh, it's very much an art form, like how... Dr. House approaches medicine, which is why I'm on your podcast, because this podcast is is focused on artistry, right? 
Yes. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, a, a outstanding painter, although I do like to paint and uh, you know, I'm not much of a musician, although I like music, but my art is the continuous development and study of plant health and plant diagnostics. And that is my art form. And that's what I, what I practice. Cause it's not something you can purely learn from a textbook. It's a lot more complicated. So, you know, Dr. House on that show, yeah, he's a doctor, but he's also a freaking cool artist, right? He approaches those crazy mysteries. I don't know how those script managers did that, but you know, it's it's a good script. They come up with some mystery and it looks clear cut and then it's not. And then they think it's something else and then it's not. And then Dr. House comes in and he's like, A, the person's lying or B, the person tra- traveled to some crazy country on the other side of the world and picked up some rare bacteria there and then they brought it back and blah, 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 blah. That's actually very similar to a lot of the problems I see every day. Um, so if you want to think about being a doctor of plant medicine, um, the, the glamorous comparison would, would be Dr. House, which is pretty cool. That is pretty Not cool. A bad comparison. Uh, I feel a little bit more spot on with my general physician. <laughs> yeah. Analogy. No, that's, um, that's, yeah, no, it's, it's accurate. How do you, so I, I get overwhelmed with, like, I don't check the news until something big happens and then I read up on it. Or, you know, I don't really like keep up with a lot of things just because it, it's usually not timely information. There's like a difference between like wealth of information, like information overload versus like information that you're more likely to retain based on the situation in which you learn it. You know, like I can apply that right here. So like that information is going to stick a lot better. Um in lieu of your comment about always learning and always, you know, growing and teaching yourself new things, like how do you balance, you know, everyday things, but also, you know, being aware of new things that are happening and how, what's your growth loop look like? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, it is tough. And I think, I think the first thing is to try to train your brain to take in information without being overwhelmed by it and w- without without letting it put too much emotional stress on what you are absorbing. And I, I'm not talking about just what's in my field, but like you said, current events. I mean, if, if you turned on the news every morning or opened up your news digests and went through every story, you could be overwhelmed with the weight of the world before 7.30 in the morning and you've had your first coffee. Uh, so... I'm I love that you have your first coffee at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of us start work at, at 8 o'clock, Nate. No, um, I, I do too. I just don't have my coffee until like 8.30 or 9. <laughs> oh, oh. What? What? How do you function? <laughs> um, yeah, it is tough. Luckily, I, I am not, um, I'm not prone to, to getting too upset about what I read. So I can wake up in the morning and stumble to the bathroom and turn on the journal podcast, which is one of my favorites, you know, and then I listen to snacks daily, one of my other favorite podcasts and, uh, read quartz news digest. And then I'll usually look at like entomology today, you know, which has a lot of updates on the entomology world. And I'll check Facebook and look at the plant groups and see what they're discussing. And, um, I I definitely try to budget what I'm absorbing because we're, we're really limited in terms of time these days. And I, I, I do try to avoid the Instagram feed. That's a disaster. I'll uh, spend 20 minutes watching cat videos instead of learning. Ah, <laughs> the, cat videos. Cat videos. No, the funny thing is yeah. he's not even kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're addictive, man. Um, but yeah. And you know, I like avoid Facebook timeline as much as, as possible. And, and those feeds, which are, which are just endless, and you know, there's a lot of cool stuff on them. But I try to be more more targeted in what I choose to absorb. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's always more you you could absorb if you had time. It's just you gotta you gotta choose what you want want to spend your time on, and that's something I've always struggled with. I've never been good at time management, um, but at least now that I'm out of school and I have you know a fairly normal eight to five job kind of thing. Um, I, uh, I'm finding it easier to budget my time now and podcasts are awesome. 
I mean, kudos to you guys for making a podcast, but um, I mentioned Snacks Daily in the journal and, and I listened to a couple of others. Um, they are so, so helpful. Uh, having like a 20, 25 minute deep dive into a single story that uh, gives you some context to just keep in the back of your mind. And then when you're going about your day and you hear people talking about it or you see other news articles, you know, you can slide that information in next to it. Um, and then also realizing that you don't know all the information. That's a big thing. Uh, I think we're all susceptible to the crooning, cro what is it? The crooning, Kruger Dunning effect, that one, you know, where you, yeah. you, I know, yeah, Dunder, you know. Dunder Mifflin effect. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about the Dunder Mifflin effect right well, now. <laughs> oh, Nate lives the Dunder Mifflin effect. We don't have to go there. Yeah. Please, yeah. Matt, continue. Uh, but yeah, I like being aware of that and um, just trying to remain humble in what you know. And then very, very importantly, remembering what you don't know is um, almost calming in a way. It, it should not be a stressful thing to realize that you're not an expert in everything. It should be comforting. Like you don't have to be an expert in everything and you don't have to pretend to be. Um, people generally respect you if you say, I don't know, or I'm, I'm going to look into that further, or I'm going to go ask someone who knows more about this than me. And that goes for current events, but also what I do in my daily job, because every single day we see crazy new stuff and there's always new situations, new scenarios, new insects, new pests. Um, so, you know, if I don't know something, that's not hurting my ego. That's like, huh this is a great opportunity to, to go dig through the library and read some reports from 1920s and go ask a couple of experts and then maybe solve the mystery. And uh, I love that's that. Actually, that's actually a really interesting point because I feel like especially with all of the fake news out there and the science and um, discoveries are ever debunking previous theories, how do you how do you balance like new information versus old information? How do you go through your, like, let's say you did find something from the 1920s. It was like, Oh yeah, that's actually what's going on. But that's contrary to what we know now. Like, how do you balance that? That's a good question. Yeah. It, it is tough because people tend to think of knowledge and science as concrete, but it is fluid. And, uh, you know, it, it always has been. And it, it drives me a little bit bonkers when people say things like, follow the science or the science says this, because that's just not how science works. You know, science is a process of learning and learning about what we know, what we don't know, what is more likely, what is less likely. And it just continually develops like that. So when people say follow the science, what they actually mean is that they are following you know, the, the general consensus of the finite number of people who are doing really good quality research into that field and lending credit to this idea over that idea. Um, and honestly, I think we would all be much better off if we remembered that. Um, and not in a bad way. Again, understanding that process and knowing that we're all fallible and all trying to find what is the more accurate answer. Now that's a good thing. Um, but chalking it up to like fake news and false news and I'm on this side and you're on that side and, and these kinds of polarizing approaches to something that is very fluid is, uh, is, is problematic for sure. And, and yeah, like if you, if you read a lot of anthropology papers, for example, who reads a lot of anthropology papers? Not you probably don't. Neither do I. But if you do read them, I was about to ask, are you talking yeah. about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Um, but you know, it's the far past, and so like one scientist will come up with a theory, and he'll justify it and try to make sense of it, and that'll be like the accepted theory. And then the next year, someone else will come up and say, "This new discovery made overturns what we knew about this subject," and and when you see those kinds of things, it's bizarre because at every change of direction, there are people out there who are um, saying 
this is the correct thing and this is what the science says and this is what is true and then that next paper will come out and be like we just learned something new that just overturned this thing and tweaked this idea a little bit and then those same groups of people will be following that new path which now makes sense and saying the same kinds of things like this is the truth this is what we now know this is the modern idea um and it goes on like that and you know i'm a scientist i love science but uh, it's it's really weird to see that when you see people so overly confident in the the in knowledge and what they know and then something new comes out and then all of a sudden they don't really admit that they were maybe not 100% spot on before they just turn to that direction and continue to be extremely confident in, in what they know and it's a really weird dynamic when you see that but i see it a lot and and um it just goes back to like the idea of science is a process and are you uh, sure you're not a political science major uh, i dabble okay uh, but you just no, not. <laughs> okay <laughs> That it's, was a, just that was a wine, Matt. There was yeah. a that was a very good definition <laughs> of uh, any politician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, I, I think that's just the human the human approach to things. You know, it is totally normal for us as humans to want to be right, to want to be on the right side of an idea, to want to be on the right side of history, to want to be on the right side of politics. Um, that's just normal. And I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with that. Everyone wants to be right and following the correct path of knowledge. Um, but fact is, not everyone is on the same path. So either everyone on this path is correct and everyone on that path is incorrect, or the truth may be somewhere in the middle and maybe not everyone knows everything and maybe we need to be a little bit more patient and understanding and listen to both, both paths, you know? Um, so that's kind of how I approach things. Uh, I think we could all use a little bit of a dose of humility in, these, in this day and age. So I, I'm listening to a book on Oppenheimer right now. And there are, it's, it's talking right now. He's in the portion of, in the book, he's like going through the portion of his life where he's a teacher. Um, in California, he's a professor in California, and his colleagues would say of him that he never really finishes any of his ideas, like any of his discoveries. His math was really bad. His actual like legwork was really bad, but he was really creative. He just came up with really cool ideas. So like half of me was wondering, as someone who doesn't know too much about like the actual scientific method and like how discoveries are made, if he just like through the course of his tests, he would just find really crazy stuff and then try to figure out how to hypothesize it and how to like write it down and see if it actually existed. That's how they found black holes. Do you ever find that in your, your plant diagnoses? Like, you know, someone's like, Hey, I have this problem and like house, you know, you don't know what it is, but like, you have to kind of like where and when do you have to like think outside of the box to try and find a solution to plant issues? All the freaking time, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think getting caught in your box um, is really, really dangerous in this line of work and in medicine, for the, for that matter. Um, yeah, one of the core rules of being, or being a diagnostician and in particular field diagnostician, is not going with that first off immediate assumption in your head like oh this sounds like this disease and i've seen it a hundred times before it's most likely that disease it's taking that step back remembering that exceptions are the rule in nature remembering that there's a lot of complex factors at work um, and uh not going with that initial gut response of like overconfidence so taking a step back talking to the people who have the plant, trying to get all this background history, and then trying to assess it, see if it makes sense. A lot of times it doesn't make sense. I was on Cape Cod um, last month uh, going around with some neat properties, and there's these uh, cedar trees, juniperus species, just dying there. 
And this is a native plant that uh, is really, really tough um, and it does well in that area historically. And some are just dead all of a sudden, it's like died just this year. And some of the same species Actually, of tree. Can you back up for a minute? How? Sure. I mean, I know it depends on the problem, but how long does it normally take a tree to die? Good question. Uh, some diseases and pests work really rapidly and can kill a tree in a few weeks to a month. That's wow. pretty. That's pretty rapid. Uh, that's okay. kind of rare. Most of the time, it's a slow, gradual spiral downwards of health. Uh, in most cases, a tree starts to decline over one or two years, and then it starts to, to have some limbs dying off over one or two years, and then maybe you'll get some crazy rots in the base of the tree, some what we call secondary fungi that are not really strong pathogens, but they move into weak tissue. You'll get these secondary pests and diseases come in, and then you'll get some secondary root issues that come in, and then you'll get this spiral downwards of all of these factors playing into it. And then over the course of a few years, the tree will die. So it's, it's typically a slow process. And that makes our job really difficult because we are humans walking into this situation at a snapshot in time. And I walk onto this property and I am there for like five minutes. And it's very difficult to remember okay, well, this tree's been here for like 50 years. It's seen a lot. And I don't know what happened last week here, much less last summer here, much less over the past 10 years. Uh, and that's, that's really, really important, especially as uh, climate issues are, are increasing rapidly in a lot of areas. Um, yeah, if, if you want to talk about something scary, look into the the changing climate patterns in different parts of the United States, well, and the world. But um, in New England, for example, where I was, they're, they're seeing a much faster shift in climate than the rest of the country. And that's bringing uh, much warmer winters and a lot more rainfall in the winters rather than snow as a result. And that has direct implications on everything I need to consider when I'm looking at these trees. Um, because those things like warmer winters and more rain in the fall and the winter, that has implications for root health and that has implications for soil drainage and some of the diseases that attack roots that like warm, wet weather or cool, wet weather, some of them. So when I walk onto those properties, I really need to take that out of, a, out of the box approach and think back in time, think, I, I look at the history, I look at climate data, what happened on this site last summer Maybe there was a really, really terrible drought last summer, and now those effects are just starting to show up the next year. And that's really common. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to go out of the classroom where you're looking at specific pests and diseases and then walk into a landscape, and you're, you're just one little person in a snapshot in time trying to solve a mystery. So, you know, if you like that sort of thing, it's... Endless joy. Let's put it that way. It's also frustrating at times, but um, that's what I like. And yeah, climate's masochist? terrifying. <laughs> hmm? I said, are you a little bit of a masochist, Matt? Let's not go there, Nate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could talk about that all day long. I bet um, you could. Thanks. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> feels like we should unpack lots of things. Um, no, I was. I wanted to ask uh, Nate, uh, who landed at Plymouth Rock? I don't know, Phil. Who landed at Plymouth Rock? The Pilgrims. Oh, I thought where's, it was a joke. Where's that near Cape Cod? Uh yeah, you, sh you should be all about that early American history, there, uh, colonial boy. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware. I just didn't know if you were, if it was supposed to be a joke or not. No, it's a joke. Yeah. Okay. Now we went to Boston. Matt, were you with us on that trip when we went to Boston as a family? I was not. You were not. I okay. missed out on that, Troy. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
God, I wish I could have gone on a Smith family vacation. In the van? In the van. Was it was there always history involved? <laughs> Almost always. Yeah. We okay. went to Williamsburg so many times. I would have probably enjoyed it as a kid. No lie. I'd have probably enjoyed it because I was a history nerd. I remember this one time we went to Williamsburg. We were there for, I don't know, a long weekend, maybe the full week. And I got we went to went to the water park there and I got really bad sunburn, like really bad sunburn. And we know I, we, we know how you burn Nate. Yeah. I, I I remember very well like shadow hopping the next day because it was like almost a hundred degrees and very hot. And like my little body was in so much pain. I was there for one of those trips to Williamsburg in the water park with you all. Maybe that was it. It might have been that one. I think your dad was there. Yeah. We were in a town. We were in a timeshare. because No, yeah, you were there for that. We were, I remember sitting on the back porch. I don't think we were old enough to drink yet. But I think we were like smoking cigars. <laughs> Probably. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Start while you're young. Found a silver ring that had been run over by a car on that trip outside of where you were staying, and I still have it somewhere. Sterling silver. I was like, ooh, silver. So speaking of, um, uh, strangely enough, I guess, New England and their extremely cold winters. and How do you uh, feel about the Buccaneers lineup this year, Phil? Same as last year. Don't care. Go Pats. You know, you know, Tom Brady left to play for the Buccaneers, right? Nate, where have you been? Yes. <laughs> yes, I know Tom Brady plays for the okay, freaking just... Buccaneers. Don't you sports ball me, Nate. Don't you sports ball me. There's one thing on this damn show you're never allowed to bring up, and that is sports. He took Brown with him, too. Case closed. Brown came out of retirement to, for, to to catch for the Bucks. Yeah, what's he doing now? I think he's hurt. Again, no sports ball, Nate. No <laughs> sports ball. <laughs> Mac, please continue with the uh, changing climate uh, in northeastern um, U.S. Uh, will there be no more blizzards coming to New England, and we'll be underwater in the next ten years? Not sure about blizzards. The main thing isn't that the, well, in a lot of cases, the storms get worse. What's weird is that there's going to be much less snowpack and more precipitation during their winters up there, which is already happening. Um, But that precipitation is falling as rain instead of snow, which is not good. Snow is great. Snow is an insulator. You know, it insulates the soil. It melts slowly. So it, it doesn't overwhelm the system with vast amounts of water. Um, but large amounts of winter rain up there is not good news. Uh, I can give you another neat example. I was up in Maryland a couple months ago, and there's a, there's a type of tree called a chestnut oak. It's an oak tree, but the leaves look a lot like chestnuts, so chestnut oak. And there are these mature chestnut oak trees in this, in this area uh, that are, you know, old trees and they're big trees, like, you know, hundred feet tall in these neighborhoods, beautiful trees over the past, like five years. And then especially the past two years, they've just been flat out dying. And you drive through these neighborhoods and, uh, there's these chestnut oaks everywhere that are either completely dead or almost dead. And, No one knows why. Um, This has happened a lot of times. Like we had a disease called Dutch elm disease that came into the U.S. and wiped out the American elms that used to be planted in all of our cities. We had the emerald ash borer that recently wiped out most of the ash trees in the entire eastern United States. Um, And so these major diseases do move in pretty often. Um, But in this case, there is no clear cause. Like these chestnut oaks that are dying they don't have a single major invasive pest or something that we can point to and be like, aha, that new disease is wiping them out. There's none of that. If you look at them, they've got a bunch of secondary stuff and they've got like the soil issues called 
Uh, like there's one disease called Phytophthora. Sure, they have that. There's another secondary root disease called Armillaria. Sure, they have that. There's some beetles that attack weakened trees. Sure, they have that. But they don't have like a single cause that's killing them. Those, those sound like the side effect for like over-the-counter drugs. <laughs> it's like, yes, you know, yes, you'll go to sleep easier, but may cause diarrhea, knee pain, and possible vomiting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when you, when you look at those situations and you're, and you're like, all of these trees in an entire area are just flat out rapidly dying, and we don't know why. And all these experts are looking at the situation and they're like, we, we don't know why they're dying. What does that mean? Um, a, it, it means you need to take a step back and look at the regional situation. And then B, it, you need to think of it in terms of the life of the tree. Again, we're not, we're just humans looking at that tree. I was there for five minutes looking at one tree. That's five minutes in a tree's lifetime that's been there for the past 60 years planted by somebody's house, you know? Um, so this so is I'm, this is something. Yeah, I had, I had a I had a question about like the ecosystem of the trees. So yeah, let's let's take the let's take the climate change up in New England for example with the you know change in the temperature overall temperature, the average temperature. Like, what is do do ecosystems have a cycle? Do they? Like, do some plant forms come and go? I know, like, entropy theory says that it started at one point and goes to another, but does it have cycles? Like, do you see kind of kind of like a seasonal change, like leaves falling off, you know, every year, but on like a longer timeline? Does stuff like that happen? Or is it most of the time does. it's like no. stuff gets introduced? Yeah, it, it definitely does happen. The, the difficulty is that those kind of long-term things, we can write about them and we can look at some records, um, but we can't test it scientifically. You know, We can't easily set up an experiment to test how an ecosystem responds to gradual change over 500 years. We just can't do that because we are such short-lived beings. So we can hypothesize about that stuff and and... We certainly do that a lot, but it's very hard to test. And that's one of the challenges with what we're facing now, because not only is change always been happening and it's still happening, but now that change is accelerating and happening on a level that we're not really familiar with before, that's why these chestnut oaks in Maryland and Pennsylvania, for example, are probably all tanking because they've been under constant stress for the past some years. And then in the past few years, those areas have had some, you know, really difficult summer, like bad summer drought periods and way, way more rain than normal in, in, their, in some of their seasons. And they just are finally, they've had enough and they can't take those stresses anymore. And that's most likely why they're dying. Like it's that spiral I mentioned. It's not a single point, single cause but it's this combination of factors, much of which is driven by weather and climate, that is weakening them in an entire region that's gradually. And you know the, 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 that begs the question, then what do you do about that? Because yeah. we're dealing with people who are just really upset that their beautiful tree outside their home is dying. What do you tell them? If you just say, oh, it's climate change, no, they don't really want to hear that because they think that's just a, a cop-out if their tree is sick, surely there's something we can do to help it. Sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. Um, God, you sound a, like house right now. Yeah. <laughs> or, a, or a doctor. Yeah. Giving, giving bad news to a family. Yeah. No, there's a lot of bad news. And we try to explain it. Like, we'll say, you know, there's no single cause here. We don't know. Our uh, best guess is this. Did you have to go to class for bedside manner or plant side manner? <laughs> I was, I was literally, I was going to ask that. I'm like, how much of your job um, has to do with consoling old ladies whose dogwoods are dying in their backyard? That's a significant portion of my job is consoling old ladies whose dogwoods are dying, Nate. I need to buy you a drink, man. That's tough. <laughs> That's tough. I'm going to write an essay called Plantside Manor. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, no, 
that's a significant part of the job. Plants are, you know, people are not paying us generally to go diagnose and treat a plant that they don't care about. They're, they're paying us to go and diagnose and treat a plant that has some kind of emotional attachment for them. Um, same with how people spend a heck of a lot of money to take their dog with some kind of kidney failure to the vet and they'll spend thousands of dollars to save their dog because they love their dog and have that emotional attachment to their dog. They care about it. It's kind of similar with a lot of our customers who want to save their tree, their dogwood tree. And, you know, Nate, you, you may have said that as a joke, but that's actually happening. People all over the Southern United States are asking us why their dogwoods are dying. <laughs> so Very funny. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, it sorry it's to the, break the bad news to you, Nate and everybody else listening. Yeah. Um, so it, it sounds like every, as, as Americans, everyday Americans, um, and hearing this news about the, the redwoods in California, or I know a couple of years ago, the kudzu root that was uh, proliferating and there was a large um, project to eliminate that because of its um, spread, uh, that this, this problem shouldn't be taken lightly, that our agriculture and our forests that we all enjoy, our national forests, you know, down in Harrisburg, George Washington National Forest, um, even, our, even our plants backyard are seem to be affected by this thing called climate change. And I know, yeah, as you said, that's a, that's a cop out for things, but we should be aware that, um, where am I trying to go with this? Hold on a second. My feeble brain, <laughs> my brain, my one brain cell, not that it's so much. It's real. Is it that the things that we should have been doing a long time or, you know, decades ago, are now coming, it's coming to bite us back in the face and yeah. it's going to be gone before we know it. Yeah. 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 I, I, you're right. These are, you know, organisms that are very old in a lot of cases and take a long time to recover. And we can't pretend like we're going to come up with a snap solution and we can't right. pretend like even if we had a snap solution that things would recover in a, in a hurry. That's just not how nature works. Nature takes a uh, long time. Yeah, it does. Yeah. That's, that's the, so that's the other question that I had, um, about plant life's adaptability. And so even with the declining climate change, like what's the, are there studies on how certain plants adapt to their changing climate? Like, are there some plants that adapt faster than others? How similar is it to like animal life that take like a couple generations to, you know, maybe weed out the weaker genetics. It's very similar. It's just on a longer time scale. And that is where this problem of climate change accelerating, that's where it's the problem. Plants are very resilient. Like we shouldn't have this idea that plants are just going to all die of all of a sudden because temperatures rose two degrees. That's not how it works. Some plants will die, and then other plants who like those hotter or wetter temperature, wetter conditions, or whatever, they'll move into that system. You know, the, the system is always going to be there. There's never going to be what like. Do you, what do you What do you mean by move into that system? I'm picturing like the two towers with the trees just like walking through the forest. Like <laughs> that, that's not a bad analogy. We'll so have an ent moot. Well, yes. Ent yes. Moot. <laughs> okay. Massachusetts, it's going to have their first ent moot. Yeah. Here we go. No, um, that, that's not terribly far-fetched. Um, in, New, in New England, for example, that I mentioned earlier, uh, we already know what will happen in terms of what trees will move into that area as things change. We know that the, the range of certain trees that are a little bit further south, like a Pennsylvania, Maryland area, their range is expanding up into New England further than they have before. Some trees that are in New England are being pushed further north. So sugar maples, for example, maple syrup. Sugar maples are being pushed further north than they ever have been in history, human history, I mean, that we know of, uh, because of the climate issues there. And red maples, which does better in a warmer climate, is moving up further. So it's displacing the sugar maples 
as they as that kind of border of their oh. ranges moves further north. Oh no, I got to move to Canada now. Our maple <laughs> syrup prices are going to shoot through the roof. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that that does happen. Like black cherry is another tree that we know is moving further north because of the because it likes those conditions. So in most cases, it's not like we're going to have all the trees in one area die and be left with nothing. We'll just have other trees and other species move into that area. That being said, that's really stressful on the system. And what happens to the animals that live there? What happens to all the other organisms that were very well adapted to those species and now they have to move or die or it's it's a lot of stress on the system so that that that's comforting in a way that nature is so resilient but it's resilient over a much longer time period than we are typically willing to tolerate uh, another good example if i may digress is is oaks so oak trees are really strange and that we talk about like red oak and white oak, but those are actually like vast groups of oak trees that are not really clearly defined into this species and that species. There's all of this weird hybridization and really diverse genetics among oak trees. So oak trees will like always cross pollinate and then they'll have tons and tons of acorns and seeds. And those seedlings will have really different genetics. And that's great for oak trees because it means that some of those oak trees may do very poorly and die, and other oak trees may have slightly different preferences and do really well if conditions change. So oak trees in that way are very resilient. And over generations, they can adapt very well to changes in climate. Tree but generations or people generations? That's the problem, tree generations. Which so, is like 300 years. <laughs> in some cases, yeah. So what's happening is that the ability of oak trees, for example, to respond to these changes in weather and climate that are happening faster than, than ever before that we know of, or that we, since we've been recording it at least, um, that's putting a lot more stress on their ability to adapt. Plus, we're introducing invasive pathogens and invasive pests. So the contributions that we're making to add stresses to this system are certainly substantial. So you know how like in the 1800s, uh, they imported rabbits to Australia as a sporting event. And then they just kind of like took over everything. And so they had to bring in coyotes to deal with the rabbits. Um, how, how much of an effect does, I'm trying to figure out a way, like figure out a way to like put this, um, how how much of an effect does the like global warming aside does like the ef effect and behavior of humans have on plant life? Could someone like damn it, go Nate, to I was gonna get there. I was <laughs> gonna be like, how much did our our colonists, our you know, family descendants fuck up North America by bringing yeah, literally, all the plants like, like, and flora exactly. and fauna so, from Europe? You know, so, some lady from Holland that got used to this potted plant, you know, she's like, I really want this potted plant from you know from from deutschland and she gets imported you know this this tree and then that tree just completely just like nukes <laughs> their neighborhood because the other plant life isn't used to it like does something like that happen or is that hyperbole oh, yeah, yeah. No, that hat that is that is so much reality it's not even like i'll give you an example uh so there are endless examples of how humans have have screwed up the environment and there's you can get into the weeds of that like I people th I think debate a lot about it but yeah i read ahead, i read sorry no i was i bought a year ago i bought gun germs and steel and there was a whole section about like how civilization has moved and how like plant life with humans has screwed things up so that's just that's just that i think that's where like i got that thing from but yeah please continue yeah so i don't know if you've read that at all I haven't, um, <laughs> but it's good. A little old, a <laughs> little old, but it's good. I like old books. I like them a lot. Um, for example, so in uh, in New York City, in the Bronx, uh, there was this this. Uh, hey yo, there was this mycologist named named Merle, 
who uh, worked at the New York Botanic Garden. And uh, he went across the road to the Bronx Zoo. Uh, and this was in the early 1900s, I believe. And uh, he found this canker disease. So like a, a fungal wound canker on, on chestnut trees at the Bronx Zoo. And he took a sample of it. And it turned out to be a disease that we now call chestnut blight from, from Asia originally. So in, in Asia, the, their chestnuts there evolved alongside of this chestnut blight and they're tolerant to it. Like, yes, they'll get it, but it's not going to wipe them out and kill them because they've had many, many, many generations of this fungus and the trees growing alongside each other. So most likely some poor soul that was very unfortunate brought in some, some, some sort of chestnut species from Asia and it had that fungus growing on it. And that fungus jumped to our American chestnut trees, which did not develop with this fungus. And it turned out that the fungus was lethal on our chestnut trees. And from that point in, in the Bronx where that initial infection occurred, uh, that disease completely obliterated the American chestnut tree, which used to be one of our keystone tree species in the entire Eastern North America. I mean, this was, this was the tree. This is what the colonists you know, used for a lot of their construction, for houses. That's what a lot of the native mammals used for nuts in the, in the, in the, in the winter, major food source. Um, it was a great tree. It was kind of like how oaks are today. And that one disease that someone unfortunately brought in wiped out that tree to the point where you can still find chestnut trees in the wild, but once they reach like a certain size, the fungus is still around and the fungus will move in and wipe them out. So functionally, the species is extinct. You can still go and find them, but they're no longer the majestic, enormous, bountiful chestnut crop producing species that they once were in North America. And that, you know, has enormous effects on the ecosystem. And our ecosystem adapt, sure. But then we had Dutch elm disease where I come in and, and throw things for a loop again. And then we had emerald ash borer come in and throw things for a loop again. And then now, one of the interesting ones that, that I'm working on is a new disease called beech leaf disease. And it's looking to be another of these major ecosystem shifting problems. And this one's really, really tough. It's caused by a microscopic worm called a, a nematode that is inside of the beech leaves causing damage. And uh, I've been going up to Ohio and, and Connecticut and some of these areas where this disease is wiping out beech trees. And it's, it's both fascinating to see this stuff in action. It's also humbling and a little bit terrifying too. Like there's this tiny worm in the beech trees up north and in Ohio and very difficult to control. We don't know how to stop it. We don't even quite know how it's moving, um, but it's slowly killing beech trees, which is another really important nut producing tree in our, in our forests. So that's, you know, job security for me. If I want to look at the bright side of it, it's also um, kind of terrifying, but I'm glad I can at least contribute to the research and hopefully we'll find some sort of solution for it. We can only yeah. try. How, uh, since humans are playing a huge role in stuff spreading like that, like how, how much of modern plant medicine, how much can modern plant medicine help with like our new technologies and our new, like modern view of like chemistry? Like, have you been able to help in a lot of ways? Like have you ever stopped something like that? Like how does the out of the box thinking come into play when you're you know assessing these things it certainly does come into play and chemistry has played a, an enormous role people tend to bash pesticides a lot and and just kind of consider anything to do with pesticides as like a very touchy subject bad for society bad for human health bad for this bad for that Fact is, we owe an awful lot to pesticides. I mean, the fact that we can live in Florida and not have 
everyone dying of malaria, malaria. and yellow fever is thanks yeah. to pesticides. Uh, so I, I've studied a lot about pesticides. I've taken classes in toxicology. I've done some research on, on certain new pesticides. Um, with the idea that we're trying to find chemistries that are, that are not only safer, but more what we call target specific. So try to only target what we're trying to target and minimize effects to other things. And then try to find chemistries that are, um, yeah, safer to the applicator um, while still being effective, cost effective, things like that. And we've made enormous strides in that industry. Um, again, people bash the companies that are developing pesticides and in some cases, perhaps for reasonable causes, but we have made enormous strides. I mean, if you look at the pesticides that they developed back in like the early 1900s and the forties and fifties, um, they absolutely revolutionized agriculture and they allowed us to support the number of people that we have in the world today. But a lot of them were also super toxic and bad for the environment. And nowadays we have a lot of other options which are much less harmful to the environment. And a lot of them are extremely effective. So those kinds of, of um, innovations are really awesome. And they certainly have made a difference. Diseases that used to be really hard to control and would wipe out crops and put people's lives in jeopardy via starvation, like a lot of those diseases now we can very effectively manage. So there's a lot of good that's come out of it, for sure. And I mean, our food supply is reliant on innovations like that to continue into the future. So yeah, it's a, that's a really cool area of study, oddly enough. You wouldn't think pesticides are cool, but I assure you they, they can be interesting. Oh, uh, speaking of you know keeping a lot of our food sources alive, um, how, how easy or difficult would it be for a terrorist to do or use some sort of like ecological attack because i know like back in the day they would you know like burn crops and they would contaminate rivers like is that a thing in like parts of the world or like could that be a thing it has been a thing in fact i think it was during don't quote me on this but i think it was during world war ii um I believe the Allies introduced Colorado potato beetle into Eastern Europe or Germany or in, into that area as a form of biological warfare to, to limit their food supply. Um, that, that definitely has happened in the past. People have tried to use pests and diseases to directly impact someone else's food supply. Um, which is pretty terrifying. Um, <laughs> but it, it has happened, unfortunately. And, you know, it, it goes both ways. Like here in America, a lot of people complain about this pest from China and that pest from China and this weed from China. But China is also full of invasive species from the U.S. They have, they have their own stuff to deal with. They, they probably look at some of our weeds and pests over there the same way we look at theirs. So we're a global system now, whether we like it or not. There's a lot of movement of everything. And what uh, what classifies a weed? Because I've always like yeah. I always thought dandelions were really pretty, but my mom's like, no, those are weeds. You gotta gotta take them out. So like, what what yeah. what, what what's classified as a weed? If you pick it, I'll give you a nickel. That's a great You're question. Not, that, that's that's not even a joke, Phil. Like that that's a re that was real. I know. That's why I did it. <laughs> that and walnuts. Nickel? What a, what a deal. Um, no, it was most, mostly walnuts, less dandelion. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a great question, and, and it's one that the plant community has kind of grappled with over the years. Basically, a weed is totally a human-designated definition rather than taxonomic. And by that, I mean not all of the species in this genus are weeds. What a weed is is when a human looks at a plant and says, I don't want that plant there. That plant needs to go. That plant is ugly, spreads too fast, harmful to my environment, toxic to my pets, whatever. That is what makes a plant a weed. So, so it's it like so entirely it's like a pickup line getting used by a hot guy versus an ugly guy. What? It's like yeah, when you what? like 
<laughs> when you take the same pickup line and a hot guy uses it versus an ugly guy, ugly guy is creepy. Hot guy is romantic. I, I see your I see your um, train of thought there. I'm not. I'm not hey, it's, sure that's hey, do you want to pick up a couch? Idea. <laughs> Worked on Bruna. Uh, wouldn't you? Would you say it's more like the Greeks saying anyone else not Greek or barbarians? That's a slightly better analogy, yeah. Because we don't want you here. Yeah. Yes. You speak a different language. Yes. You do things differently than us. You're a barbarian. <laughs> Get out. Yeah. So, like, do you guys know Bradford Pears, for example? Those, yes. yes yeah. I've heard, yeah. So, people love Bradford Pears for some, for some horrible reason. Like, Bradford Pears have been a staple in American landscaping for years. Landscapers, landscape developers, like, people build houses... They want a tree to put in the front yard before they sell the house. Let's put it in Bradford pears. Bradford pears are awful. They're they're in, essentially invasive in a lot of areas. They're they're very weak wood. They smell bad when they bloom. That's they get, what I was going to say. They get say. a lot of diseases. Those things smell like shit. They Bradford do. pear. Okay. Yeah. So for some people, they love their Bradford pears. For a lot of other people, they are like Bradford pear is an invasive weed. So again, it's it's a human designation, and it depends who you ask. And there's a lot of examples like that. The plant world is full of it. So that is what a weed is. It's an unwanted plant. If you have a good reason for not wanting this plant in this location, you have just designated that plant as a weed. Someone else may not. A lot of people love dandelions, for example. A lot of people go to great lengths to protect their dandelions for some reason. Um, but a lot of other people consider them weeds. I know rodents are like there, them. Yeah. Are there any uh, going back to the coyote and rabbit analogy? Are there any St. Looney Tunes? Like, yeah, <laughs> violent. <laughs> There's an anvil in there somewhere. Yeah, where's the anvil? <laughs> Some dynamite. I don't know. <laughs> That's always really good. Really funny Family Guy clip. Peter like yanks it, like tethers an anvil to like a tree. And like puts a like puts a, a treat under it, trying to catch something, and then you know he pulls it up. You know, the anvil's hidden up in the tree, and he runs over behind the tree, like you know, he's laughing, and he's like, "Oh, sweet candy!" and runs up to go get it. <laughs> anyway, um, are there any like unwanted plants that should be removed, like violent plants, so to speak, that'll like fuck up the ecosystem that like should rightfully be removed so that they don't mess up the violent uh, harmony. I, I have oh, one I'm, and maybe tr- that, that was the maybe. best way I could like figure out how to describe <laughs> it. Like, like invasive plants that should be eradicated. They want to commit mortal combat on all our native plant species. Uh, I have one. Maybe Matt, you might tell me no, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Bamboo. So Why? It grows so fast and just takes over more space that's needed by our own native plants. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, there are there are some. Oh, well, there's a lot of bamboo species. There's also one native bamboo species. Um, you gotta be. Area. You gotta be shitting me. There's bamboo here in the U.S. Yeah, it's not wild. There's a native bamboo species. In fact, it played a really important role in Native American culture because it was so useful. Um, that aside, uh, the bamboo that you're talking about is, is by pretty much all counts, highly invasive. It spreads very fast and it's extremely difficult to get rid of once it's in there. So people will put it in and think like, oh, this is going to make a nice screen for my backyard or something. And then 20 years later, it's everywhere in the neighborhood and nobody can get rid of it. So yeah, that's a great example of a plant that is very easily becomes invasive. Um, another cool example comes to mind. I mean, there, so there are a lot of invasive weeds and the farther South you go, the more there are because those plants come from tropical regions. So Florida is chock full of invasive plants. Is, is, is there racism in plants? Yes. Nate, are you saying I'm a plant racist? <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> that's another topic. That is another topic for sure. But I, so I can give you a really a really fun example that that's kind of an ongoing problem. Um, 
So there's this plant in the south called Chinese tallow. Very, very invasive plant. It is all over the southern southern United States. Like the further south you go, the more, more it loves that area. And uh, it displaces native plants really, really effectively. It seeds very heavily. Seedlings pop up everywhere. So by all ecologists' accounts, it's a terrible, terrible invasive plant that has to go or has to be managed somehow, okay? Chinese tallow. But it just so happens that the Chinese tallow, as most trees do, unless they're conifers, flowers, and honeybees like those flowers. They have a good nectar supply from those flowers. So honeybees are not native. Honeybees are what we have here in the States as as like honeybees producing honey are originally European honeybees primarily. So the beekeepers in the Southern United States, a lot of them actually like Chinese tallow because they don't see it as an invasive plant destroying the local ecosystem so much as they see it, oh, this is a great supply of flowers for our bees and we want to protect our bees and give them a good food supply and make honey. So scientists are caught in the middle of this. And it's, it's fascinating because on the one hand, you have like a whole team of USDA uh, scientists, and one of my friends is one of them, who have spent decades researching what insects we can introduce into the ecosystem that will help manage Chinese tallow without destroying our native plants. So they've done a lot of research to find like this insect and that insect that they can release into the wild and it will chew on those seedlings and help prevent some of those seedlings from establishing. Because the only alternative to get rid of these plants is spraying herbicides all over them. And if possible, it would be much better for the environment to introduce an insect that can help eat Chinese tallow rather than having to go out and spray them all with herbicides, which is labor intensive and not great for the environment, but neither is Chinese tallow. And now there's some campaigns among certain beekeeping groups calling for the USDA to not release these insects. And they're saying from their perspective, you know, this is going to be a disaster and kill our bees because the USDA is trying to release these insects that are going to destroy this valuable nectar source. So they're painting it like, we want to be ecologically friendly to our bees. And some of the scientists are painting it like, but our only alternative is spraying them with herbicides. And we want to introduce these insects that will environmentally friendly help manage this invasive weed. Why does the, U- why does the USDA classify it as, a, why, did, why don't they like those trees? Because the trees spread so rapidly through natural areas and overtake natural vegetation. So instead of this complex of native species growing that supports the native wildlife, you have large stands of Chinese tallow displacing those native plants. Gotcha. And it's very hard to get rid of them. They seed prolifically. Yeah. So it's tough to get rid of once it's there. And that's a fascinating conundrum because you've got people on both sides who care about the environment in their own way, um, but they're at odds. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange situation. What would you do? Are, are the bees that these, uh, uh, what are the beekeepers called? I know it's an apiary, but what are they, mm-hmm. what is a beekeeper called? A beekeeper. Okay. Um, yeah. What, uh, were the bee are the bee, the bees aren't native? You said the honey bees are from Europe. Correct. Um, did the beekeepers import them, or and or what did the bees subsist on before the the invasive tree showed up? Great question. Um, in fact, that's is there a way? Is there a way to asked. like give the bee an alternative food source? Oh yeah, totally. There are plenty of native species that will support honeybees quite well. Um, in fact, if Chinese tallow they, wasn't they just, here. They, they just they just like this tree. It's just yeah. it's, it's better. <laughs> Basically, yes, yeah, yeah. So Europeans brought over honeybees for honey production and for pollination. But North America has tons of native bee species. It's just not the honeybee. But we have tons of native bees, which 
are honestly a lot more important for our ecosystem because our native plants here, most of them rely on those native species for good pollination. Um, the honeybee is not, an okay pollinator get, for uh, crops, but it's not like the best bee for our continent. Yeah. Not to get like super political, but. I thought um, you were going to say, speaking of the bee movie, and I was going to be like, oh, no, gosh. you did not. But continue. Everybody's either a dude or a sister. Um, <laughs> so the whole the whole mentality of like colonization at, versus taking care of yourself first and worrying about yourself. Like I know you said that the world is all one big. Like we're we're all in this together, so to speak. Like how does that? How does like taking care of your own ecosystem? mesh or not mesh with the fact that plant life doesn't care about human politics or human interests. Mm. Like, Hey, his, his poison Ivy is getting across my fence and into my yard. And the neighbor's like, I don't care. <laughs> like it's, it does what it wants. Like, Oh, that's a very, existential question and by that i mean yeah humans are responsible for spreading all kinds of horrible weeds around the world to different areas and doing harm that way but humans are also responsible for spreading cultivated crops all over the world is there, is there like a geneva convention for plants like you know not like you're, not allowed to spread the, you're not allowed to spread this one around but this tree over here, that, that one's okay. Like that one's not going to fuck us <laughs> up. Um, I don't think there is. And, you know, maybe at some point in the future, there will be. Like, I suppose UN's FAO should be doing that kind of thing, but they really don't do a whole lot. Um, but yeah, that that there are some organizations where they make it their mission to ship crops, seeds, odd fruits, odd cultivars of certain crops, like they will ship those to new parts of the world with appropriate documentation and certifications and whatnot. And they'll, for example, take a specific kind of bean, for example, that does great in one part of the world and ship it to a area of Africa that is you know, really needs some new crop options. Say they're struggling to, to have food and they'll ship certain kinds of improved bean varieties to that area where those farmers can grow them out and see like, oh, hey, this kind of bean that we were able to get does much, much better in our local environment than these ones that we had before. Let's switch to this crop and thereby have more food. Like that actually does happen. And that's a really cool way of improving humanity. Um, there is some risk there because you got to make sure that you're not spreading invasive plants all over the world. But for the most part, if you have crops that are highly bred and improved for food production, in most cases, they're not going to be very invasive because we intentionally breed their defenses out of them when we make crops. Like wild tomatoes, for example, Wild tomatoes are extremely bitter and have higher toxin loads than our modern tomatoes because we wanted modern tomatoes to be edible and not toxic. But those toxins in the wild tomatoes are great defenses at preventing that plant from being eaten by everything. So most of our crops... Is, is, there, not, is there not a natural form of non-bitter tomato? Um, I don't think so. No, I think so. I wonder the, at, at what point did they're like, man, that would be really good if it tasted good. We <laughs> should breed that shitty taste out of it. Like, why didn't they just be like, yeah, that berry doesn't taste good, so we're not going to eat that. Like, that's I wonder a, at what point. Yeah, that's a great became question. Like a time to get into that anthropology journal. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's a great question. I don't, I don't know. Um. I guess beans and quinoa are kind of like that. Like, you know, if you eat quinoa, raw quinoa, and you don't rinse it thoroughly and soak it and rinse it, like it has a lot of those saponins in it or something that 
I don't, I don't eat a lot of quinoa. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Need well, some meat and potatoes kind of guy. Yeah. Point being that we still have some crops that are borderline toxic because plants produce their own toxins. I mean, plants are chock full of what we would call pesticides. They just produce them naturally um, for their own defenses. So, yeah. so we're going to pick it, breed the defense system out of it, and then eat it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. That is what we have done throughout history. We have oh, Im- man. improved crops to have more nutrients, more carbohydrates, larger seeds, larger fruits. And so, generally so what that is your, comes with lower defenses. What is your opinion? Like, this, I, this isn't a dig into vegetarianism at all but like would humanity have survived as long as it or as flourished as much as it has had we not bred so many plants to be palatable no i don't think so interesting i don't think so at all i think i think cultivation and plant breeding has been absolutely critical to the development of of humankind Um, like people glorify hunter-gatherer type cultures looking back and you know they kind of create this noble savage-esque um perspective which i think is rather dangerous wasn't it voltaire who created the noble savage idea i think it was voltaire anyway you know french french philosophers aside pretty 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 sure it was edgar rice burroughs but no the guy that wrote Tarzan back in the day. Well, he certainly he certainly would have enhanced that way of thinking, like the noble savage glorification of simplistic primitivity, all of that sort of thing. I mean, the fact is that being primitive, yeah, you may have been closer to nature, but nature is also full of malaria and poisonous plants and a lot of dangerous things. So, um, so how I do you balance nature trying to protect itself with the idea that we're mostly responsible for global warming? How do you balance that? So, like, you know, it it is our fault that global warming is happening, but nature is also like not set up that way if we didn't do anything. Hmm. I don't know how you balance that. I think we need to stop thinking so short term and and think more long term in terms of our preservation as a community or as a species. You know, humans are very, very short lived beings with short term goals and and memories and short term (laughs) memories. Gosh, yeah, yeah. So that's that. Be that is so much easier said than done. Like saying, oh, we need to think long term and think of our great grandchildren, think of the world in a hundred years. Like that's so much easier said than done. It is so hard for us as humans to even comprehend that sort of thing. Is there an herbological NATO? Not that I'm aware of. No. Mm. Greenpeace. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Food for thought. Literal food for thought. I'm still waiting on that tomaco to be produced. Tomaco. Yeah. They've got the the potato tomato hybrid, you know. No, I don't actually. Yeah. You can grow a tomato and and graft it into a potato rootstock so that you got tomatoes on one end and potatoes on the other. No shit. Isn't that freaking crazy? That's awesome. That sounds unnatural. <laughs> No, they're very closely related plants. Same group. So is it a root or a fruit? <laughs> that Both, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What will we wow, think of crazy. next? Self-microwave and burritos. <laughs> All right, Jeff Bezos. Or, that's what they should be. Instead of freaking going to space, can we get Jeff Bezos to, or Elon Musk to come up with that? A self-microwave burrito. That would change the world. That it's would, like the that would what, solve what did they what did they microwave in Spy Kids? Was it a hamburger? 
Man, I haven't seen yeah. that movie in you so know, long. You know what I'm talking about? It, it was like like a microwave bag of popcorn, but it was like a hamburger and fries. I regret I think that we so, ever yeah. liked that movie, Nate. Yeah. Hey, don't hey. knock Spy Kids. That was a great film. For a Rodriguez nine-year-old. is a creative genius. Yes. The same guy that gave us fucking Sin City and Once Upon a Time in Mexico. <laughs> yes. Talk about versatility, man. Yes. Well, Bill, you look like you had a question. No, I don't actually. I'm uh, I, as I as I look at my clock. Um, when did we want to wrap this puppy up? Well, I got to pee, so yeah. So I'm probably Matt needs to <laughs> fill up his wine glass, but um, I, do, I do. Yeah. Uh, maybe read some anthropology today, or now, <laughs> or then. Um, shout out! Great to, name for wow. a journal. Anthropology then. Anthropology then, and <laughs> yeah. Shout out to uh, whoever wants to create the next uh, great anthropology journal and um, the and, and the plant life NATO. Plant life NATO. <laughs> Nate's Nate's gonna own plant life NATO. So trademark that man. Yeah. Um, well, no, uh, it'd be Napo, the North yeah. American Plant Organization. Napo. Okay. Nate, you could be the uh, chairman and or high priest or high priest and or um, uh, point of sale shaman plant. Oh, we had a we had a what do we have? We had the um, QAnon shaman. Now we have a plant shaman. (laughs) All I can think of is that South Park Scientology episode. (laughs) What was that? Oh my god! Hey, before we wrap up, in the closet with uh, what's his name, John Travolta. Yes, Matt. Yeah, Matt. Hit, hit us with a, some a, knowledge. A plug for uh, the plant plant science world. Hell yeah. Um, well, if you know, this is, is obviously that a publication. A, no, 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 no. Oh, tell us about your um, publications. Oh, my publications. Well, yes. um, I've uh, published about tea and yopon tea. If you're into that, that's a, a native caffeinated plant that the Native Americans used as tea. I've done some research on that. Um, done some research on chili thrips. I write a lot of pest fact sheets. Anyway, that stuff is not super exciting. But what is exciting is that if any of your listeners have an interest in developing the plant science world or interested in diagnostics, what I do, solving plant mysteries, solving agricultural mysteries and the future of humanity by agriculture improvement and whatnot, um, you know, definitely pursue that stuff because it's both interesting and fulfilling and we need it. There are plenty of programs out there and plenty of jobs out there in this area. So, um, I mean, if anybody wants to hit me up and ask about like what it means to be a plant doctor or study plant medicine in terms of (laughs) what I do and not growing weed, then please hit me up. Um, yeah, feel free. As we uh, as we established before we got started, that knocks out about half of our audience yep. base. <laughs> half of our audience base just wants to know how to grow weed effectively in their closet in their college dorm room. So, yeah, shit. All right, Matt. Um, so, where can people find you? Speaking of where to find you, where can people find you? Hit us up with your socials. I'm mostly on Facebook, just Matt Borden. Friends with Nate, if you're friends with Nate. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Matt Borden on Facebook. I um, run a group called What's Wrong with My Plant, where we nice. help people diagnose plants. Um, so I'm there all the time looking at sick plants and helping people figure out what's wrong with them. I'm on Instagram a little bit, M underscore Borden. Um, yeah, m- mostly Facebook is where I hang out because there's so many good plant groups on there and, you know, old ladies with plant problems, which is got the great audience they're nice people so yeah i hang out there a lot you're kind of pace yeah for the modern life you're kind of pace (laughs) yeah yeah sweet okay well nate where can uh everybody find us well hopefully when this episode comes out our website will be back up and running but it's frame this podcast.com and at frame this podcast on instagram and facebook also, we yeah. have a non-functional Twitter page. And as always, you can check out our uh, page on Podbean at 
uh, podbean.com forward slash frame this podcast. And uh, as we Apple podcast, Spotify Apple podcast, podcast, and also um, all platforms where you get your main YouTube. Oh yeah. yeah. Check out our YouTube page. Nate, what have you been doing on YouTube? I just re-uploaded all of our thumbnails to make it more uh, attractive. There We're trying is. to give the people <laughs> what they want, as Excalibur says on AEW on Fridays and Wednesdays. And my light. Oh, I can't talk about sports, but you can talk about wrestling. Hell yeah! Really? Hell yeah! All right, because I know what I'm talking about. Um, no, it's because I shat on the Patriots. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> well, everybody. <laughs> Uh, thanks for listening. Um, Nate, as we always say. Oh, I thought you were going to start. Uh, stay safe, guys, please. Well, first, stay speaking, safe. Speaking, speaking of uh, human born <laughs> diseases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you first, haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. They're not going to microchip. They're not going to microchip you. You're not going to. You know, zombify yourself. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not drooling out of my mouth or losing my bowels. Well, maybe just when I watch television, but that's another story. Um, because that's the real killer, television. Um, yes. Stay hungry. Stay creative, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for being on. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, guys. This was this was fun. <laughs>